Chapter 7 Do baptism and the Lord's Supper have any place in the present dispensation of the grace of God? IT is most distressing to one who has reveled in the grace of God for years, but has recognized on the other hand that grace produces loving obedience in the heart of the believer. To read the puerile and childish diatribes, Ironside seems to have worked himself into a frenzy by this point, of the ultra-dispensationalists, as they inveigh against the Christian ordinances as though observance of these in some way contravene the liberty of grace. The liberty of grace is not the issue, because that liberty states that all things are lawful unto me, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12. Rather, the issue is sound doctrine. Paul says to hold fast the form of sound words, 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. Therefore, when Ironside tries to take away, among other things, our spirit baptism by which we live for Christ, God's word commands us to stand against such an attack of sound doctrine. Insisting that Paul had a new ministry revealed to him after Acts 28, and that this ministry is given only in the so-called prison epistles, they make a great deal of the fact that in these epistles we do not have any distinct instruction as to the baptizing of believers, or the observance of the Lord's Supper. Water baptism is the sacred cow of Christianity. Most Christians say that water baptism is an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. Regardless of dispensation, that is never the definition of water baptism found in Scripture. In Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, God says that Israel will be a kingdom of priests to reconcile the world, i.e., the Gentiles, back to God. In Exodus 29 verse 4, we see that a Jew is washed with water as part of his ordination as a priest. Ordinary Jews are never water baptized in the Old Testament because the time is not yet for them to go to the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom. However, the first words in the ministry of both. John the Baptist and Jesus are, Repent, ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew 3 verse 2 and 4 17. Therefore, they water baptized believing Jews, as a way of making them part of the kingdom of priests, who will reconcile the Gentiles back to God in the Millennial Kingdom. We must note that Jesus confined his ministry entirely to Israel, since he said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24. Therefore, water baptism was only done of Jews in Israel's program beginning with John the Baptist's ministry. Water baptism, at that time, was required for salvation, Mark 16 verse 16 and Acts 2 verse 38. By the time Paul comes on the scene, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. This tells us that the gospel for today does not include water baptism. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Paul cannot be talking about water baptism, because he says to these same Corinthians, I know not whether I baptized any other, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 16. Since that is the case, Paul could not make the statement that all of the Corinthians were baptized into the body of Christ if spirit baptism is accomplished by water. Paul did water baptize some of the Corinthians, and the reason was so as not to stumble the Jews, who needed water baptism for salvation as part of Israel's program before Paul's call in Acts 9. Rather, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4 says that, we are baptized into Jesus Christ's death. The word baptize means to be identified with. When we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, we are given the Holy Ghost, Romans 5 verse 5, who immediately baptizes us into Christ's death so that we may walk in his resurrection life, Romans 6 verse 4. Therefore, today's baptism is a dry baptism done by the Spirit into Christ's death. It has nothing to do with water. Then, in Ephesians 4 verse 5, we are told that there is only one baptism, which means that God does not even recognize water baptism today. With that being the case, why would anyone want to get water baptized, since it masks the true baptism into Christ's death? With regard to the Lord's Supper, that is an observance for today, as Paul tells the Corinthians how they should conduct the Lord's Supper. See 1 Corinthians 11 verses 20 to 34. However, we must note that the Lord's Supper is a full meal. It is not a wafer and some grape juice. The Christian religion has made it something it is not so that they can control it so that you must. 
come to their church and do what they say to do in order to partake in the Lord's Supper. However, as far as God is concerned, we have the Lord's Supper every time believers get together for a meal. We have already seen, I trust clearly, that Paul himself disavows any new revelation having been given him after his imprisonment. Paul received the mystery by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verse 12. However, he did not receive it all at once. He said, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1. Paul said this because Jesus told him that he would make Paul a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, Acts 26 verse 16. Therefore, Paul did receive a new revelation of the mystery after his imprisonment, and those things are recorded in Ephesians, Colossians. However, he did not receive a new dispensation at that time. Rather, he was just given further revelation of mystery doctrine. For example, Ephesians 1 verse 21 gives the governmental structure in heaven, which was not written down in any of Paul's previous epistles, but insists that the mystery was that very message which he had already made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. It was but part of that whole counsel of God which he had declared to the Ephesians long before his arrest. These brethren, by a process of sophistical reasoning, there is no sophistical reasoning necessary in order to see that water baptism has been replaced by Holy Spirit baptism into Christ's death. Rather, scriptural reasoning is used by the Holy Spirit in the believer's heart to come to this conclusion, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. Try to prove that baptism belonged only to an earlier dispensation and was in some sense meritorious as though it had in itself saving virtue, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 verse 16, repent and be baptized, for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Both of these verses make it clear that baptism would have some saving virtue at the time when the kingdom of heaven was at hand for Israel. Therefore, we believe that water baptism was required for salvation, not because some religious philosophy says so, but because God's word says so. Ironside is the one following religious philosophy. Because there is no scriptural backing for believing that water baptism is an ordinance that shows a person's salvation, but that since the dispensation of grace has been fully revealed, there is no place for baptism because of changed conditions for salvation. Absolutely, Christians take great offense to the idea that salvation conditions change over time, but the Bible is clear that they do. When Peter preached Jesus Christ in Acts 2, he preached it as the anti-gospel or bad news, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain Jesus Christ, Acts 2 verse 23. Peter did not tell his audience to trust in Jesus' death in order to be saved. Yet, in preaching Jesus Christ today, Paul says that the gospel is how that Christ died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. If you do not recognize the changed conditions, then you are calling God a liar. To state this argument is, but to expose its fallacy. Let one point be absolutely clear, no one was ever saved in any dispensation on any other ground than the finished work of Christ. Agreed, but the mid-Acts dispensationalist is not stating anything to the contrary. There are two parts to salvation, one, the payment for sin, and two, the way to receive that payment. Christianity teaches that the payment for sin was Jesus' death on the cross and the way you receive that payment is by trusting in his death as atonement for your sins. However, for most of history, these two parts were not the same. The payment for sin, regardless of dispensation, is always Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. However, the way a person receives that payment is by having faith in what God has told him. What God tells him differs based upon dispensation. For example, Genesis 15 verses 5 to 6 says that Abram was declared righteous by believing that God would make his seed as the stars in heaven. No mention of Christ is given there. Hebrews 9 verse 8 says that, the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. That is why the twelve disciples said, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? John 14 verse 5. When Jesus responded, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father, but by me, John 14 verse 6, for the first time in history, man knew that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was the way to the Father. According to
Hebrews 9 verse 8, no one in the Old Testament ever knew that. Therefore, for 4,000 years, what you had to believe to be saved was different from the actual payment for sin. If not, then everyone who ever lived before Jesus' first coming will go to the lake of fire, but we know from scripture that this is not true. The fact that the twelve disciples did not preach believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for atonement of sins can also be seen by examining Matthew, John. In Luke 9 verse 6, we are told that Jesus had the twelve disciples preach the gospel, but, two years later, we are told, from that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples, how that he must go unto Jerusalem, and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day, Matthew 16 verse 21. Peter's response to that was, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee, Matthew 16 verse 22. If Peter had been preaching Jesus' death as atonement for sins, Peter's response would have been, Do you preach? What do you think I've been telling everyone for the past two years? The point is that the gospel the twelve disciples preached could not have been today's gospel of trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins, because they had been preaching the gospel for at least two years before Jesus began to shew them of his impending death. While Ironside is correct in that the method for payment of sin is always the finished work of Christ, he is incorrect in assuming that what man trusts to receive that payment for sins is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That is what we trust since Acts 9, but the gospel was different before that time. It had to be in order for the Bible to be true. In all the ages before the cross, God justified men by faith. In all the years since, men have been justified in exactly the same way. That is not true. In today's dispensation, we are justified by faith alone. Romans 3 verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. However, in Israel's dispensation, they were justified by faith plus works. James 2 verse 24 says, Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. That is because salvation for Israel required that they have faith in what God told them which was to put themselves under the law covenant. Therefore, they had to do works that showed faith in that law covenant. Today, however, God has told us to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. Ye are not under the law, but under Grace, Romans 6 verse 14. Therefore, our justification today is by faith alone. For Ironside to say that man has always been justified in exactly the same way, he has to change what James 2 verse 24 says or what Romans 3 verse 28 says, because they present two different methods of justification. Adam believed God and was clothed with coats of skin, a picture of one becoming the righteousness of God in Christ. We are never told that Adam believed God. God clothed Adam with coats of skins, Genesis 3 verse 21, to show him that salvation is by God's covering, not by man's covering, religion. We are not told what Adam did with that information. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Yes, but, as previously mentioned, what Abram believed was that God would make his seed as the stars in heaven. He did not trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for his sins. Nevertheless, afterwards he was circumcised, but that circumcision, the Apostle tells us, was simply a seal of the righteousness he had by faith. What Apostle tells us that circumcision was a seal of Abraham's righteousness? Of course, it is Paul, in Romans 4 verse 11, the Apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. However, that is not all that Paul tells us regarding Abraham here. He says that Abraham is the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, Romans 4 verse 11, and Abraham is the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, Romans 4 verse 12. This shows that faith plus works is required for the circumcision, Israel's program, while faith alone is required for the uncircumcision, the body of Christ. Since faith plus works is required in Israel's program, circumcision was required for salvation. When God gave Abraham the commandment of circumcision, God said, And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant, Genesis 17 verse 14. 
Thus, we see Abraham being justified in two different ways, so that he might be the father of all those who believe. That is how Paul can use Abraham as an example of justification by faith. Romans 4 While James uses Abraham as an example of justification by faith, plus works. James 2 verses 21 to 24. Dot. And throughout all the Old Testament dispensation, however legalistic Jews may have observed the ordinance of circumcision and thought of it as having in itself some saving virtue, it still remained in God's sight. As in the beginning, only a seal, where there was genuine faith, of that righteousness, which he imputed. How did Ironside determine that? When God gave Abraham the requirement of circumcision in Genesis 17, he said, And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people, he hath broken my covenant, Genesis 17 verse 14. That is quite clear that the seal of circumcision was required, or else that person would not be part of God's eternal kingdom on earth. The difficulty with many who reason as these Bullingerites do, is that they cannot seem to understand the difference between the loving loyal obedience of a devoted heart, and a legal obedience which is offered to God as though it were in itself meritorious. Right dividers understand this difference. They believe God when he says that faith plus works are required for salvation in Israel's program, and they believe God when he says that faith alone is required for salvation today. It is Ironside who fails to believe God's word and recognize that God requires different things under different programs. The different requirements make perfect sense when you recognize that God treated Israel like children, while he treats us today as full-grown adults. The phrase children of Israel is found 341 times in the law books of Exodus Deuteronomy alone, while God says of us today, Thou art no more a servant, but a son, Galatians 4 verse 7. Therefore, as full-grown sons, we receive eternal life by faith, while, as children, Israel must have the works of faith, in addition to faith, in order to have eternal life. No one was ever saved through the sacrifices offered under law, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. As previously mentioned, Ironside has confused the payment for sin with the method by which man accepts that payment. Yes, Christ's blood is the payment for sin for all dispensations, but the method by which Israel received that payment was by believing God would give them eternal life by their having faith in God's provision for them under the law covenant. Nevertheless, wherever there was real faith in Israel, the sacrifices were offered because of the instruction given in the word of God, and in these sacrifices the work of Christ was pictured continually. Yes, only when the sacrifices were offered in real faith, were they pleasing to the Lord. However, note that forgiveness of sins was actually attained by offering the sacrifices, because the offering of these sacrifices was the work of faith. Leviticus 4 verse 26 says, He shall burn all his fat upon the altar, as the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings, and the priest shall make atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. Leviticus 5 verse 10 says, He shall offer the second for a burnt offering, according to the manner, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, for his sin which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. The verses do not say, Thou shalt offer the burnt offering as a faith response, and then their sins will be forgiven them after Christ makes the real payment for sin. Rather, their forgiveness was conditional upon them offering animal sacrifices for the atonement of sin. Therefore, the sacrifices were the method by which Israel accepted Christ's payment for their sin, because the sacrifices were a work of faith. When John the Baptist came in the way of righteousness, he called on men to confess their sinfulness and their just desert of death by baptism, and so we read that the publicans and sinners justified God, being baptized with the baptism of John. There was no merit in the baptism. If they justified God, as Luke 7 verse 29 says, it means that God would not have been just if he gave eternal life to them without being baptized, because water baptized was required in order to be saved. If there was no merit in baptism, it would say that they glorified or praised God. It would not say that they justified God. It was the divinely appointed way of acknowledging their sinfulness and need of a savior. Therefore, it is called a baptism unto repentance for the remission of sins. Ironside has combined Matthew 3 verse 11 with Acts 2 verse 38 to come up with his quote. 
Does he not see that the quote he just gave goes against his assertion that there is no merit in baptism? Acts 2 verse 38 clearly says that baptism is for the remission of sins. It does not says, baptism in order to let everyone know your sins have been forgiven. This shows how Christians are so used to changing God's word to fit their religious views, that they are not offended when someone takes the holy word of God and changes it to fit the Christian religion's view, instead of just believing what the verse says. They were like men in debt, giving their notes to the divine creditor. A note does. Not pay a debt, but it is an acknowledgement of indebtedness. Christ's baptism was simply his endorsement of all of these notes. Most people do not realize this, but Christ was actually baptized twice. Everyone is familiar with his water baptism here, because that is what Christianity preaches. However, they skip over his most important baptism, which is his baptism into death. Christ says in Luke 12 verse 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with. This baptism is still future in Luke 12 verse 50, even though he had already been water baptized in Luke 3 verse 21. Matthew 20 verses 22 to 23 makes it clearer that his future baptism would be his baptism into death. It was this baptism that was Christ's payment of their indebtedness, not his water baptism. His water baptism, like the rest of Israel's, was part of his priest ordination ceremony, as commanded in Exodus 29 verse 4. When he said to John, who would have hindered him from being baptized, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness means that Jesus had to fulfill all requirements of the law and all the requirements of being the Messiah. In other words, John the Baptist told Jesus, you don't need to be baptized, because you do not have any sins to be forgiven of. Then, Jesus responded, True, but allow me to be baptized, because it is a requirement for me to be the anointed of God, since all priests must be washed in water. Jesus' anointing as the Messiah is confirmed by the fact that the Holy Spirit came upon him at that time, and God the Father recognized him as his beloved Son, Matthew 3 verses 16 to 17. Without this water baptism, he would not have been the Messiah, the Holy Spirit would not have indwelled him, and he would not have been able to perform his ministry. It was as though he said, in this way I pledge myself to meet every righteous demand of the throne of God on behalf of these confessed sinners. And this is surely what he had in mind when, three years later, he exclaimed, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Luke 12 verse 50. Ironside is so blind to the truth that he mentions this second baptism without recognizing that it has nothing to do with water or that his death baptism is a separate baptism from his water baptism. Today, Paul talks about us being baptized with Christ into his death. Romans 6 verse 4 says, buried with him by baptism into death. If this was water, it would say submerged with him by baptism. A burial is done of a dead person, not. of someone you pour water on. It is this death baptism that is the one baptism of the grace dispensation that God recognizes, Ephesians 4 verse 5. The problem is that people get this confused with water baptism and bring water baptism, a requirement only of Israel in the last days, into the grace dispensation. On the cross, he met the claims of righteousness and thus fulfilled the meaning of his baptism. Jesus met the claims of righteousness by living his entire life without sinning, Hebrews 4 verse 15. What he did on the cross was that he was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Christian baptism has its beginning in resurrection. Nope. Christian baptism has its beginning in Christian tradition. The only baptism God recognizes today is the dry baptism of the Spirit into Christ's death the moment we are saved. This dry baptism has its ending in resurrection, since, because we have been identified with Christ's death, we are also identified with his life, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4. It was the risen Christ about to be glorified who commissioned his apostles to go out, not simply to Jews, observe, nor yet to proclaim a second offer of the kingdom, as some say, but to carry the gospel to men of all nations baptizing those who profess to believe, in, or, unto, the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Not so. Jesus told them to be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 1 verse 8. 
They were commissioned to go to the Jews only, Matthew 10 verse 6, until Jesus' second coming. Jesus said, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. If what Jesus established in Matthew, John is still continuing today, then the gospel should only be going to Jews today, because Jesus has not come back yet. Also, with regard to a second offer of the kingdom, Jesus said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, Matthew 24 verse 14. Therefore, Jesus commissioned his disciples to offer the kingdom to the Jews only until his second coming. If not for the interruption of that program with the dispensation of grace, that is what would have happened. This. We see them literally doing throughout the early days of the church, as recorded in the book of Acts. We never see them going to the Gentiles before Israel's program is put on hold with the call of Paul in Acts 9. In Acts 2, we are told that they stayed in Jerusalem, going house to house, Acts 2 verse 46. All of the believers stay in Jerusalem until after the stoning of Stephen, when there is a great persecution against the church at Jerusalem, Acts 8 verse 1. Even then, they are only scattered among Judea and Samaria, while the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, because they were not done going house to house there yet, Acts 8 verse 1. And, even among those scattered to other areas, we are told that they were preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only, Acts 11 verse 19. Wherever the gospel is preached, baptism is linked with it, not as part of the gospel, no, baptism is part of the gospel. Peter says in Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. If they were not water baptized, they would not receive the remission of sins. For Paul distinctly says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, but as an outward expression of faith in the gospel. That is because Paul was preaching a different gospel for a different dispensation. Paul specifically calls his gospel my gospel in Romans 2 verse 16, Romans 16 verse 25, and 2 Timothy 2 verse 8. No other person in the Bible ever refers to the message he preaches as my gospel, not even Jesus Christ. That is because Paul was given a message from God that no other person received directly from God. So, Paul can say that water baptism is not part of his gospel, while Peter said that water baptism was required for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. We can also see the different gospels by comparing John the Baptist with Paul. John the Baptist was so much into baptism, because it was required for salvation, that we call him the Baptist. Paul, on the other hand, did not even keep track of water baptisms, because it was not part of his gospel. Also, Paul never said that water baptisms were done as an outward expression of faith in the gospel. Paul performed limited water baptisms so as not to cause offense to those Jews saved in Israel's program. It is evident in the book of Acts that there is a somewhat different presentation of this, according as to whether the message is addressed to Jews in outward covenant relation with God or to Gentiles who are strangers to the covenants of promise. That is because there are two different Gospels. In Acts 1-7, Peter was sure to baptize everyone who believed. Then, there was a change in program, bringing about a different gospel, without water baptism, with the call of Paul in Acts 9. Yet, water baptism still continued to some extent. Limited water baptism continued so as not to offend the Jews, who had to be water baptized in order to be saved. Paul said, Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20. Paul says that ye are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14, yet Paul put himself under the law to gain those under the law. For example, Paul had Timothy circumcised, Acts 16 verses 1 to 3, even though Paul says, for in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, Galatians 5 verse 6. Although circumcision means nothing today, Paul had Timothy circumcised so as not to offend the Jews, who had to be circumcised in order to be saved, Genesis 17 verse 14. Similarly, water baptism means nothing today, but, so as not to offend the Jews, who had to be water baptized in order to be saved, Mark 16 verse 16, Acts 2 verse 38, Paul sometimes water baptized people. 
Therefore, just because water baptism continues, in part, with Paul, it does not mean it is for today. Since no one alive today is saved by water baptism, there is no need to partake in it today, because it can only lead to false doctrine. People say that water baptism is an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace. However, the water from the baptism is only on the person for a minute or so, then, the outward manifestation is gone. Circumcision is a permanent manifestation, therefore, it should be favored over water baptism. Of course, like baptism is only spiritual today, so is circumcision, as Colossians 2 verse 11 says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Therefore, if you want an outward manifestation of an inward work of grace, it is best to have the attitude of yet not I, but Christ, Galatians 2 verse 20, putting off the deeds of the flesh and putting on the new man, Colossians 3 verses 8 to 14. That is the true outward manifestation of an inward work of grace not drops of water that are quickly wiped off after a dunking. Paul calls these two aspects of the one gospel, the gospel of the circumcision and the gospel of the uncircumcision. Not true. Gospel of the circumcision means the gospel that pertains to the circumcision. Gospel of the uncircumcision means the gospel that pertains to the uncircumcision, Galatians 2 verse 7. Therefore, Paul mentions two separate gospels, not two aspects of the one gospel. Peter preached repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Paul preached trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for the remission of sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. These are two different gospels. Because there are two different gospels, we see Peter and the apostles going to a different group than Paul went to. Since Paul went to both Jews and Gentiles, Acts 9 verse 15, the heathen, Galatians 2 verse 9, to which Paul went, would be all unsaved people. Therefore, the circumcision, Galatians 2 verse 9, to which Peter and the apostles of Israel's program went, would be all saved people in Israel's program. This is important to note. Otherwise, there would still be two Gospels existing today. It is not that one Gospel applied to Jews and one Gospel applied to Gentiles. Rather, it is that the Gospel of the Kingdom applies to Israel's program in which the Kingdom of Priests was still being built with Jews before God started the Grace Dispensation with Paul. We do not see Gentiles included in the Kingdom program yet when it is put on hold in Acts 7, because the Jews were not saved yet, and they were to be saved first. Then, from Acts 9 until the rapture, the gospel of the grace of God applies to the body of Christ, in which there is neither Jew nor Greek, Galatians 3 verse 28, dot. The Jew being already a member of a nation which, up to the cross, had been recognized as in covenant relationship with God, was called upon to be baptized to save himself from that untoward generation. That is, to step out, as it were, from the nation, no longer claiming national privilege, nor yet being exposed to national judgment. Ironside is saying that God broke his covenant with Israel at the cross. In other words, Ironside is saying that, before the cross, Israel is God's people, but, since they crucified their Messiah, God decides that Israel does not get all the promises God made to them in the Old Covenant, and that, spiritual Israel, comprised of both Jews and Gentiles, will now receive those promises. That is utterly false, as it makes God out to be a liar. Paul specifically addresses this accusation in Romans when he says, I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and the glory, and the covenants, and the giving. of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, Romans 9 verses 3 to 4. By saying according to the flesh, Paul says that the covenants, the promises, etc., all pertain only to physical Jews. He does not say that they used to pertain to Israel, but he says that they still pertain to Israel. Therefore, even in the writings of the dispensation of grace, God affirms that the promises and covenants he made with physical Israel still apply to physical Israel. Rather, the issue is, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, Romans 9 verse 6. In other words, God's promises still apply only to physical Jews, but not to all physical Jews. 
In other words, they only apply to the Jews, who, as Ironside quoted, separate themselves from that untoward generation, Acts 2 verse 40. Jesus very plainly told the Jewish religious leaders that the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, Matthew 21 verse 43. If Jesus were referring to Gentiles, he would have said nations. The fact that he says a nation shows that national identity has not been done away with in Israel's program, just because of the unbelief of Israel. Rather, Jesus is referring to Deuteronomy 32 verse 21, where God said that he would move them to jealousy with those which are not a people, I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. And, in case you did not understand this, the Holy Spirit specifically calls out this issue in Romans 10 verse 19 by quoting Deuteronomy 32 verse 21 in the context of Israel's being set aside. Therefore, the covenant is still in force with Israel, but it is not in force with apostate Israel, but it is in force with the little flock of Israel, who bring forth the fruits of believing what God has promised them which makes them a foolish nation in the eyes of religious Israel, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. That is why Jesus says in Matthew 21 verse 43 that the promises of the Old Covenant will not be fulfilled with religious Israel, and then he turns around and says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, Luke 12 verse 32. Therefore, there is a spiritual Israel in the sense that not all physical Jews receive the kingdom on earth, but it is still a promise made only to physical Jews, who repent and are baptized, Acts 2 verse 38, in order to save themselves from this untoward generation, Acts 2 verse 40, of unbelieving physical Jews. They do not, as Ironside says, no longer claim national privilege, because, when God does establish the new covenant in his kingdom, which is still future, he, will only establish it with the house of Israel, and with the house of Judah, Jeremiah 31 verse 31. In fact, this is the only way God could make promises to a nation without altering the free will of man. Does Ironside honestly think that God was going to give all Jews the kingdom, including those who worshipped idols? Or, does Ironside think that God was ignorant in thinking that all Jews would believe God and enter the kingdom and that God was caught by surprise when he saw otherwise and had to change his plan, as a result? With the Gentile, it was otherwise. He was simply called upon to believe the gospel, and believing it, to confess his faith in baptism. According to Paul, all, in the Corinthian church, had been baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. If Paul is referring to water, here, then water baptism is required for salvation, or else you are not part of the body of Christ. If that is the case, Paul would not take such a lackadaisical attitude with regard to water baptism. Instead of saying, besides, I know not whether I baptized any other, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 16, Paul would have been dunking Corinthians left and right, and would have said, I may have baptized some of you twice, but I wanted to make sure all of you have eternal life. So, better safe, than sorry. And, without baptizing them, if 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 is water baptism, then Paul also would not have been able to make the statement that they are all part of the body of Christ. Therefore, Paul must be referring to a dry, spirit baptism into the death and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4, and not water baptism. Also, the idea that water baptism is merely a confession of faith is found nowhere in scripture and only serves to enslave people to the rules of the Christian church they attend so that they will not leave. It is not surprising, then, that some people are water baptized a second time, because the new Christian denomination they have joined does not recognize the water baptism of the first Christian denomination that baptized them. And this abides to the end of the age, no, that is Ironside's interpretation, and lends credence to the New Age movement. Rather, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, Matthew 28 verse 20. In other words, Israel would be a kingdom of priests to go to the Gentiles with the law. This commission abides unto the end of the world. Both John the Baptist and Jesus offered the kingdom to Israel. That offer was valid today if you will hear his. voice, Hebrews 3 verse 7. Israel was to exhort one another daily, while it is called to day, Hebrews 3 verse 13. 
Due to the unbelief of Israel, the period, called today, was put on hold with the stoning of Stephen and Jesus Christ standing to judge Israel. Acts 7 verses 55 to 56. Jesus Christ started the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ with Paul in Acts 9. Once the rapture of the body of Christ takes place, the today period for Israel will resume. This time, however, they will believe, as Romans 11 verses 25 to 26 says that, when the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, all Israel shall be saved. They will become that kingdom of priests and go to the Gentiles with the law of Moses in the millennial reign. Zechariah 8 verse 23 says that the Gentiles shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The place they are going to is where Jesus dwells in the temple in Jerusalem, as Isaiah 2 verse 3 has the Gentiles saying, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Note that the Gentiles learn the law of Moses. That is why Jesus told the believing remnant of Israel to teach the Gentiles to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew 28 verse 20. They will do this for 1,000 years. Then, Satan is released from the bottomless pit, and the Gentiles determine if they will side with Satan or with Jesus, Revelation 20 verses 7 to 10. Then, those siding with Satan, are cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Then, God brings a new heaven and a new earth, Revelation 21 verse 1. Therefore, when Jesus says he is with believing Israel unto the end of the world, he is saying that he will be with them during the entire time they operate as a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, giving them the law of Moses so that they trust Jesus as their savior at the end of the millennial reign. Since they are not fulfilling that role during the current dispensation of grace, this promise and this commission do not apply today, but will resume once the prophecy program resumes, but they must start in Jerusalem, assembling believing Israel as a kingdom of priests first. The Lord's promise to believing Israel, then, of being with them unto the end of the world, is in reference to being with them as they evangelize Israel in the seven-year tribulation and then the Gentiles in the 1,000-year millennial reign, as our Lord himself clearly declared in the closing verses of Matthew 28. This was conditional upon Israel accepting Jesus as Messiah and fulfilling their calling to be a kingdom of priests to the world. If they would have done this, we would not have had the current 2,000-year interruption in Israel's program take place. There has never been any change in the order. There was a change in the order, and the apostles of Jesus' program acknowledged it. Even though they were commissioned to go and teach all nations, Matthew 28 verse 19, at the Acts 15 Council, the apostles recognized the change in programs, such that the apostles of Israel's program agreed to confine their ministry only to saved Jews, while the apostles of the body of Christ agreed to go to all unsaved people, Galatians 2 verse 9. Peter even admitted at that council that God put no difference between us, Jews, and them, Gentiles, Acts 15 verse 9. Therefore, he recognized that the plan of Israel being a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles had been put on hold. In other words, Peter recognized the change in the order. Since the very people Jesus directly commanded in Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 recognized the change in program, we should do the same today. It has been said that the baptism of the Holy Spirit superseded water baptism, but scripture teaches the very contrary. Scripture agrees with Ironside here. Acts 2 verse 38 says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Water baptism was required in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and water baptism was required in order to receive eternal life. Water baptism is really a shadow of Holy Spirit baptism in that the Holy Spirit is living water. John 7 verses 38 to 39, while there is nothing special about the water used in water baptism. However, I think Ironside is saying that Bullingerites believe that water baptism was done away with due to Holy Spirit baptism. That is not true. Rather, water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism are associated with Israel at the end of their program, while only Holy Spirit baptism is associated with the Church, the body of Christ today. Therefore, it is. Not that Holy Spirit baptism supersede water baptism today, 
but it is that water baptism is not a requirement of the dispensation of grace. Cornelius and his household were baptized with the Holy Spirit when they believed the word spoken by Peter. Yes, this happened in Acts 10, which is after Paul's call in Acts 9. Before Acts 9, God said through Peter that you must repent and be water baptized before you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2 verse 38. In Acts 10, we are in the dispensation of grace, where the Holy Ghost is received immediately upon belief, which is exactly what happened with Cornelius and his household. Then, Peter baptized them afterward, not for salvation but so as not to offend the Jews, who needed water baptism before Acts 9 in order to be saved. But the apostle, turning to his Jewish brethren, immediately asks, Who can forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And they were at once baptized by authority of the Lord Jesus, which is what the expression in the name of involves. This was not a meritorious act. Yes, it was not a meritorious act, because the dispensation of grace had already begun. It was merely to keep the Jews, who were saved by repenting and being water baptized, from being offended. For example, in Acts 18 verse 8, Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord, and was baptized. Obviously, Crispus is a Jew, and so Paul baptized him so that Jews saved in Israel's program would not be offended. He would still be coming in contact with Jews, since the house church he was now attending was joined hard to the synagogue, Acts 18 verse 7. By the way, since Ironside brought up Cornelius, I think it is important to note that Ironside completely skipped over the fact that, after they believed and before they were water baptized, they spoke in tongues, Acts 10 verse 46. If water baptism is for today, based on the Cornelius passage, then speaking in other tongues is also for today and should probably be required before water baptism is given. Of course, since Ironside believes in water baptism today and not speaking in tongues today, he chooses to ignore the tongues part. The reason Cornelius and his household spoke in other tongues was to provoke Israel to jealousy, Romans 11 verse 11, so that Jews may be saved by believing the gospel of grace in this current dispensation. This provoking ministry of the saved Gentiles among Jewry, in which the gifts of Israel's program were displayed from Acts 9 through Acts 28, is what both Ironside and Abulingerites fail to see. Once we get to the end of Acts, Israel has completely diminished away, Romans 11 verse 12, as evidenced by the threefold rejection of the Jews during Paul's ministry, see Acts 13 46, 18 colon 6, and 28 colon 25 dash 28. Therefore, this provoking ministry stops, as does the water baptism and spiritual gifts. If Ironside wants to bring water baptism into this dispensation, he also needs to bring speaking in tongues into this dispensation, which he will not do. Of course, both of them are not for today, but the point is that one is just as valid as the other. It was a blessed and precious privilege granted to this Gentile household upon the evidence of their faith in Christ. There is nothing blessed and precious about being dunked in water today, since God does not recognize water baptism today. The one baptism, Ephesians 4 verse 5, God recognizes is of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, into the death of Christ, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4. It has been objected that the Apostle Paul himself makes light of baptism and was really glad that he had not baptized many at Corinth. It is surely a most shifty kind of exegesis that would lead anyone to make such a statement. What's so shifty about that? Paul said, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 14. Therefore, Paul was really glad that he had not baptized many at Corinth. That is believing God's word, not a most shifty kind of exegesis. In the record in Acts, where we read of Paul's ministry in Corinth, we are told that many of the Corinthians hearing, believed and were baptized. Paul did not himself do the baptizing, save in a few instances, but he certainly saw that it was done. The reason Paul did not baptize much is because, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. If baptizing was somehow beneath Paul and he made sure that others did it for him, Paul would not have baptized those that he did. Note, from 1 Corinthians 1 verses 14 to 15, that the reason Paul thanked God that he did not baptize many in Corinth was lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. 
Well, if Paul had helpers, who did all of the baptizing, any baptizing they did would have counted as if Paul baptized them. In other words, all of those. Baptized by Paul and Paul's helpers would have the potential of Corinthians saying that they were baptized in Paul's name. Therefore, he did not have anyone water baptizing people for him. It is true that Acts 18 verse 8 says that the Corinthians who believed were water baptized. That is, because they came from Jewry. So as not to offend the Jews, Paul baptized them. In the next verse, we see that the Lord summoned Paul to leave, Acts 18 verse 9. It was later on that he wrote 1 Corinthians. The problem with the truth is that some people may accept it at first, but many of those will leave soon afterward. At the end of his life, Paul said, All they which are in Asia, be turned away from me, 2 Timothy 1 verse 15. We see from Paul's letters to the Corinthians that they were carnal and acting just like the world. Therefore, it should be no surprise that, in the time between Paul's being there and baptizing people and Paul writing 1 Corinthians, many of those initial believers had left the church. That is why there is a shorter baptism list in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 14 to 16 than would be expected by reading Acts 18 verse 9. It is not that Paul had helpers baptizing for him. Also, nothing is ever beneath Paul. Paul was willing to take four Jews to the temple to fulfill a Jewish vow, even though doing so resulted in his arrest. Acts 21 verse 23 to 33. Just saved Jews in Israel's program would not be offended by the dispensation of grace. Since Paul was willing to do that, are we really supposed to believe that Paul said, Ha, huh, dunking believers in water is beneath me. Let my helpers do it. And the Holy Spirit evidently quotes the record with approval. Yes, the Holy Spirit approved the water baptisms because they helped Paul reach the Jews. In Acts 16 verse 3, Paul had Timothy circumcised. The Holy Spirit approved of that, also, not because we should be circumcised today, but Timothy was circumcised because of the Jews which were in those quarters. Furthermore, in Acts 21 verses 24 to 27, as I just mentioned, Paul took four Jews with him and all five of them, Paul and the four Jews, had their heads shaved in the Jewish temple as part of a vow they had taken. The Nazarite vow is part of Israel's program and is not for today. But, Paul did this to reach the Jews with the gospel of grace. Therefore, just like with circumcision and the Nazarite vow, water baptism is not for today, but was used by Paul in the latter part of Acts to reach the Jews with the gospel. Paul said, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20. Therefore, the distinction must be made. Between things that are done for the gospel's sake versus things that we are required to do today in the dispensation of grace. Why then did Paul thank God in 1 Corinthians 1 that he had baptized so few? The answer is perfectly plain. Because the Corinthians were making much of human leaders and he saw the tendency to glory in man. He knew that if there were many there who had been baptized by him, they would be likely, under the prevailing conditions, to pride themselves upon the fact that he, the apostle to the Gentiles, had been the one who baptized them. Yes, that is the reason why Paul thanked God that he only baptized a few, but that still does not negate the fact that water baptism is not for today. If water baptism was required for salvation, as it was in Mark 16 verse 16 and Acts 2 verse 38, Paul would have regretted not baptizing more because those people missed out on eternal life as a result. He certainly would not thank God for them still being lost. But far from making light of baptism, when he chides them for their sectarian spirit, he shows them that the only name worthy of exaltation is the name of the one by whose authority they had been baptized. Actually, what Paul does is he thanks God that he did not water baptize many because the focus should be on the gospel, not on water baptism. He says, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. In other words, Paul is thankful that he did not baptize many Corinthians so that the focus would not be on water baptism, but it would be on the gospel, which is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for atonement of sins. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. He came to the Corinthians to make sure they were saved. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2. He did not come to argue over water baptism, since it is not for today. 
As to the various disputed scriptures in Romans 6 verses 3 and 4, baptized into Jesus' death, Colossians 2 verse 12, baptized into Jesus' death, Ephesians 4 verse 5, 1 baptism, and Galatians 3 verse 27, baptized into Christ, where baptism is mentioned without any definite indication as to whether it is water or spirit, one thing at least is perfectly clear. Those four. Passages clearly refer to spirit baptism. Romans 6 verses 3 to 4 is spirit baptism, because no one is buried into water, Romans 6 verse 3. Colossians 2 verse 12 is spirit baptism, because it is a definition of the spiritual circumcision of Colossians 2 verse 11, and it is buried with him in baptism again. Ephesians 4 verse 5 needs not define what the one baptism is because you already know that from Romans 6 and Galatians 3. Galatians 3 verse 27 must be spirit baptism, because Galatians 3 verse 28 says that, by being baptized into Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. Since you do not lose your nationality, job, or gender status when you are baptized into Christ, this baptism must be spirit and not water. Water baptism is necessarily implied, because spirit baptism is but a figurative expression, and water baptism was the act upon which the figure was based. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. In other words, spirit baptism is what gives us eternal life. Without it, we are not part of the body of Christ, and we are still dead in our sins. The real baptism cannot be water, because Paul says that all of the Corinthians were baptized into one body by one spirit, but he does not know if they have all been water baptized or not. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 16. If water baptism is what brings you into the body of Christ, then it has to be part of the gospel, as it is in Mark 16 verse 16 and in Acts 2 verse 38. Paul would then be lying by saying, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Here is the issue. There are many things that God does to your spirit in Christ when you receive eternal life, such that ye are complete in him, Christ, Colossians 2 verse 10. God could not do these things to man's spirit until after Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Even people saved today usually do not understand the things they have in Christ, because their flesh is still vile, Philippians 3 verse 21, and the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Therefore, in order to help saved man understand what he has in Christ, God put fleshly types of those things in Israel's program. Colossians 2 verse 17 says that those fleshly things are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. In other words, water baptism, physical circumcision, etc., are shadows of the real things that we have today, being complete in Christ. We are told that, in Christ, ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, Colossians 2 verses 11 to 12. Obviously, this is spiritual, not physical, circumcision. Since there is a colon after circumcision of Christ, what comes after the colon is part of what came before it. Therefore, buried with him in baptism must also refer to a spiritual baptism. It is part of the spiritual circumcision we receive by which our flesh is cut off. That is why Romans 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The result is that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, Romans 6 verses 6 to 8. In other words, before you were saved, your spirit was dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2 verse 1. You had no capacity whatsoever to serve God, because in your flesh dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7 verse 18. However, when you were saved, you were given the Holy Spirit, Romans 5 verse 5, and he performed a spiritual baptism of you into Christ's death. 
Being identified with Christ's death means that you are also identified with his resurrection, so that sin shall not have dominion over you. Romans 6 verse 14. You are dead to the law, that you might live unto God. Galatians 2 verse 19. Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 5. Spirit baptism into Christ's death means that your spirit is now alive in Christ. In other words, ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3. The only way you can serve Christ is by the spirit baptism, since no good thing dwells in your flesh. Because Satan does not want you to serve Christ, he has convinced Christianity as a whole that spirit baptism does not exist. Christians think that baptism always refers to water. That way, they never understand the life they have in Christ due to their spirit baptism into Christ's death. Therefore, Ironside states, spirit baptism is but a figurative expression, and water baptism was the act upon which the figure was based. However, the opposite is really true. Water baptism was. A shadow of things to come. Colossians 2 verse 17. And one of the things that came was spiritual circumcision and spiritual baptism. Colossians 2 verses 11 to 12. Because spiritual baptism is absolutely essential to being able to serve Christ, Satan has come along and blinded the minds of Christianity lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, so that Christianity still lives in their vile flesh, serving sin, and never recognizing that they are complete in Christ. Therefore, they never serve Christ. A person trusts in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ in order to have eternal life. As a result, God makes their spirit come alive, while bringing death to their flesh. Now, for the first time, that person can walk in the spirit and serve Christ. However, the first thing the Christian church does is to indoctrinate them in their religion by baptizing them, which sets them on the career path of continuing to serve the lusts of the flesh, but doing so in the name of Christ now. Therefore, because of water baptism, they never learn who they are in Christ, and they are just as useless to Christ after they are saved as they were before they were saved, but they do not seek to change, because Satan has tricked them into thinking that all of their good deeds of the flesh will please God. They even do damage to God's kingdom because they practice their religion in the name of God. That is the real issue here, which is why Satan has tricked all Christian denominations into continuing to serve the flesh by a water baptism. This comes out in the first mention of spirit baptism. I indeed, says John, baptize you with water, this then was the actual literal baptism, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. It is not literal baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is not literal fire, but figurative. If it is not literal baptism in the Holy Spirit, then Ironside is saying that we do not have the Holy Spirit. Yet, Peter says that those who repented and were water baptized received the gift of the Holy Ghost, Acts 2 verse 38. Paul says that God hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 8. Therefore, John is most definitely talking about being baptized with the Holy Spirit. John is actually talking about three different baptisms in the one verse of Matthew 3 verse 11. The three baptisms are exactly what he says they are. One, water, two, Holy Ghost, and three, fire. If an individual in Israel was to enter the kingdom, he must repent or change his mind, which means he needs to stop following the Jewish. Religion and believe in God's provision to bring him into the kingdom via the law covenant he had made with Israel. When a Jew believed this, he would be washed with water as a priest, which is what John did. When the Pharisees came to his baptism, the first thing John told them was, Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Matthew 3 verse 7 God would pour his wrath upon apostate Israel, as they would not be part of the kingdom. Those, coming to John with repentance, were fleeing from that wrath by believing God's law covenant with them. This repentance and water baptism was only a first step. After Jesus paid for the sins of believing Israel, he baptized them with the Holy Ghost in Acts 2. Rather than being a figurative baptism, as Ironside says, they literally received the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, 
and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Peter says, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, Acts 2 verse 17. In light of these verses, how can Ironside possibly say that they were not literally baptized with the Holy Ghost? The next part of the process is a refining process through the fire of the tribulation period. God said that the Lord is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 3. The baptism with the Holy Ghost gives believing Israel the capacity to survive the baptism with fire of the tribulation period so that they are brought into the kingdom, rather than being thrown into the lake of fire. That is why, just after mentioning these three baptisms, John says, regarding the Lord, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, Matthew 3 verse 12. Believing Israel must go through the refining process of the spiritual fire of the tribulation period, or else they will be baptized with the literal fire of the lake of fire, for all eternity. Therefore, Ironside, in saying that only the water baptism is real, has eliminated the gift of the Holy Ghost in order for Israel to enter God's kingdom, and he has eliminated the punishment for unbelievers in the lake of fire. Also, you will note that not one of these three baptisms is what Paul talks about. We have already gone over how, today, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ's death. This is different from water baptism, being baptized with the Holy Spirit, and being baptized with fire. Contrary to popular belief, baptism, in the Bible, does not always mean water, as we have already seen. The word baptism simply means to be identified with. Therefore, today, our baptism into Christ's death is a dry baptism, in which our sin is identified with Christ's death so that we no longer have to serve sin. Another example of dry baptism is found in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2, where we are told that the children of Israel, in escaping from Egypt, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. In other words, they escaped Egypt because they were baptized, were identified with, God's people. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Pharaoh's army, however, drowned in the Red Sea. If baptism is always water baptism, then it was the Egyptians who were baptized in the sea, and that is not what 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2 is referring to. Therefore, baptism does not always mean water. Dry baptism is what God did for Israel in the Red Sea, and it is what God does for the body of Christ today. If this be but kept in mind, there would be no confusion. Baptism in water pictures both burial and resurrection. On this, Paul bases his instruction in Romans 6 and Colossians 2 verse 12. No. It is on this false doctrine that Christianity takes away our baptism into Christ's death today and replaces it with water. Many pastors, upon water baptizing someone, have proclaimed, buried with Christ in baptism, risen with Christ to new life. However, you will never find such a statement related to water baptism in scripture. Water baptism is first mentioned in Exodus 29 in the ordination of priests in Israel. Exodus 29 verse 4 says that the person who is to become a priest is to be washed with water. In fact, this water baptism was probably a sprinkling, because God says, in relation to the future, new covenant he will have with Israel, that he will sprinkle clean water upon them, and they shall be clean. Ezekiel 36 verse 25. We also see from Acts 2 verse 41 that a group of 120 believers, Acts 1 verse 15, water baptized about 3,000 souls in a single day, which would have been a very time-consuming and tiring task if dunking was involved. Water baptism, then, is the way that God cleanses the flesh of believing Israel to be priests of God. It does not, in any way, picture both burial and resurrection. It is Christianity that came up with that idea, and, They had to change it from a sprinkling to a dunking in order to fit their false doctrine. Thus water baptism marks people out as belonging to Christ by profession, and therefore is the basic thought in Galatians 3 verse 27, 
even though it is by the Spirit's baptism that people are actually united to Christ. Huh? How does water baptism mark people out as belonging to Christ by profession? People do not even know if you have been water baptized or not unless you tell them, and having someone splash water on you does not a Christian make. Even in Israel's program when all believing Jews were water baptized, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another, John 13 verse 34. Jesus did not say, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have been water baptized. Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20. The way we are ambassadors for Christ is by suffering for him. Paul continues by saying, giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, 2 Corinthians 6 verses 3 to 4. He said earlier, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10. In other words, the way unbelievers are reconciled to God is by seeing us operating as children of light, suffering for Christ gladly. They look at us and say, well, that guy is still joyful even though he is suffering for what he believes. I want what he has. The way that people see us as belonging to Christ is not by saying, well, some dude threw some water on him in church. I want what he has. The basic thought of Galatians 3 verse 27 is walking by the Spirit. It is not that everyone knows you are a Christian, because you have been water baptized. Galatians 3 verse 27 says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Putting on Christ means that, since your life is hid with Christ in God, Colossians 3 verse 3, you now have the ability to put off the old man with his deeds, Colossians 3 verse 9, and put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind meekness, long-suffering, and put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, Colossians 3 verses 12 and 14. When the world sees the fruit of the Spirit manifest in your life is when they begin to see the gospel as good news. Until then, Christ crucified is foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 23. Furthermore, anyone, who has been water baptized, but does not walk in the Spirit, is seen by unbelievers as a hypocrite, which blasphemes God's name, and causes unbelievers, to see the gospel as bad news, such that they would not believe the gospel, even if someone different, who is walking in the Spirit, presented it to them. It is precisely because of these hypocritical Christians, that very few people believe the gospel today. Now, Ironside's last comment is confusing in light on what he has already said. He previously called spirit baptism a figurative expression. Now, he says that people are actually united to Christ by the Spirit's baptism. Well, if there is only one baptism, Ephesians 4 verse 5, and that baptism is water, according to Ironside, then, whatever the Spirit's baptism is, it is not recognized by God, since God only recognizes one baptism today. I can only assume that Ironside believes that the Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ by the water baptism performed by a preacher, which is probably why Christian denominations generally only recognize a water baptism done by their denomination as being real water baptism. If this is Ironside's view, then he believes, although he would never admit it or even realize it himself, that water baptism is required for salvation because you are not part of the body of Christ until the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. There has been much disputation regarding the passage in Ephesians 4, but without laying special stress on the importance of water baptism, it is very evident that the passage would have no meaning if water baptism, as well as that of the Spirit, were not in view. What? Ephesians 4 verse 5 says that there is only one baptism, and Ironside says that it is very evident that the only way one baptism can have any meaning is if there are really two baptisms. That is like saying, there is only one way to God Jesus Christ, John 14 verse 6, but the only way you can understand that is if you recognize that, incorporated in that one way, are really two ways. That makes absolutely no sense. He is calling God a liar. Let me try to make this plain. What is plain is that Ironside does not believe God's word. 
In the opening verses, the Apostle calls upon the Ephesian believers, and of course all Christians, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith they have been called, and he lays stress on the importance of endeavoring to keep the Spirit's unity in the bond of peace. Then he explains this unity as being sevenfold. In verse 4, he emphasizes three special things, one body, one spirit, and one hope. Now there can be no question that the spirit is brought in here as forming the body, and the spirit forms the body by what is called elsewhere the baptism of the spirit. Then in verse 5, we have another trio, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Here it seems to me clearly enough we have, not a duplication of what we have already had in verse 4, but something that is more outward. One Lord in whom we believe, one faith that we confess, and one baptism by which we express our allegiance to that Lord and that faith. In verse 6, we have God himself as the Father of all, the founder of this blessed unity. There is nothing outward here. Paul mentions the unity of the Spirit in Ephesians 4 verse 3. The unity that the Godhead has is that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are three in one. Ephesians 4 verse 4 describes this unity of the Godhead as one body, God the Son, one Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and one hope, God the Father's gift of eternal life, to believers. Ephesians 4 verse 5 describes the unity of the body of Christ and how all three members of the Godhead are involved in creating that unity. That is, we have one Lord, God the Son, one faith, Christ's faith, to obey God the Father, and one baptism, by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Then, Ephesians 4 verse 6 covers how each individual is part of the body of Christ as a result of the Godhead's work. God is above all, God the Father, through all, God the Son, and in you all, God the Holy Spirit. The reason Ironside and others have much disputation regarding this passage is that they refuse to let it mean what it says, instead trying to make it fit their own religious beliefs, which are contrary to God's word rightly divided. Now without going into any disputation as to whether the term one baptism is to be confined to the baptism of the Spirit or the baptism of water, it is certainly evident that it at least implies water. The reason Ironside will not dispute what the one baptism means is because he cannot logically explain how two baptisms water baptism and spirit baptism really are just one baptism. Furthermore, Ironside keeps using terms like it is certainly evident or there can be no question so that you will just accept what he says as fact. That is what the Christian religion does. When you begin to question what they say and give them scripture that shows they are wrong, that is when they gave you the right boot of disfellowship. Since the word water has not even been mentioned in the book of Ephesians so far, why would it be certainly evident that Paul is at least implying water? No man confesses his faith in Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit alone, for millions have been baptized by the Holy Spirit, and yet the world knows nothing of it. Apparently, Christianity knows nothing of being baptized by the Holy Spirit either. Who are these people, according to Ironside? Are they all saved people? Are they only saved people who have been water baptized? Are they only saved people who speak in tongues? Confessing your faith in Christ simply means that you confess that you have abandoned your own self-righteousness by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins and God has given you eternal life. As a result, spirit baptism, spiritual circumcision, regeneration, etc. are all part of what happens to you as a result of having faith in Christ. Since those things happen spiritually, the natural man cannot understand those things. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, as Ironside has pointed out. Therefore, the fact that the world knows nothing of spirit baptism shows that spirit baptism is of God. On the other hand, of course, many have faith in Christ who have never been baptized in water. But that does not alter the fact that, according to the Lord's own instructions, water baptism should follow confession of Christ. The Lord has never rescinded this order, apparently, the Lord has rescinded this order. He told the eleven apostles, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16 verse 16. Then, in Acts 9, the Lord appeared to Paul. Paul received the gospel, that he preached, directly by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. That gospel is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, 
and Paul specifically says that baptism is not part of the gospel he preaches, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Therefore, the Lord rescinded the order to water baptize for salvation, when he revealed to Paul a new gospel. The apostles in Israel's program even recognized this themselves when they agreed that they would go only to save Jews, Galatians 2 verse 9, even though Jesus had commissioned them to all the world, Mark 16 verse 15. And for men, to attempt to do so is, but to substitute human authority for divine. For Ironside, to attempt to go against God's word by saying that the commission of Mark 16 verses 15 to 16 is still in effect today, and then to redefine what the commission actually says by taking water baptism out of the gospel, is to substitute human authority for divine, because it was divine authority the Lord Jesus Christ himself who made the change. The statement has been made that inasmuch as all carnal ordinances were abolished in the cross, this includes baptism and the Lord's Supper. There are many things wrong with this sentence. First, baptism and the Lord's Supper are not carnal ordinances. They are things that God instituted, which means they are not carnal. Second, the cross does not abolish God's ordinances. Jesus said, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, Matthew 5 verse 18. All be fulfilled refers to God reconciling the earth back to himself. That does not take place until the millennial reign has been completed. In that still future reign, we see Gentiles saying, For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, Isaiah 2 verse 3. However, in Acts 7, with the stoning of Stephen, God set aside Israel's program, and he started the dispensation of grace with Paul in Acts 9. In this current dispensation of grace, once we are saved, we are not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. As such, all things are lawful unto me, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12, and for me, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 23. Therefore, Christians are not under the law, but, once the rapture takes place, Israel's program will resume where it left off, and they will be under the law, as they were before. With regard to water baptism, we see Peter saying in Acts 2 verse 38, which is after the cross, that Israel needed to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. With regard to the Lord's Supper, it is funny that someone would think the Lord's Supper would be abolished in the cross, because the first time it was observed was the night that Jesus was crucified on the cross. With regard to water baptism, since it belongs exclusively to Israel's program, it was set aside along with the rest of the program when God started the mystery dispensation with the Apostle Paul in Acts 9. It is by no means abolished, because it will be picked up again once the rapture of the body of Christ takes place. In fact, Jesus Christ commissions Israel to water, baptize the Gentiles during the millennial kingdom as a necessary part of their salvation, Mark 16 verses 15 to 16. Now, with regard to the Lord's Supper, when the Lord had supper with his disciples, he was really eating the feast of the Passover, John 13 verses 1 to 2. In fact, Jesus specifically says, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, Luke 22 verse 15. The Passover, and its associated feast, was given to Israel in Egypt, as a type of how God would pass over Israel's sins and give them eternal life in the kingdom, as the result of the ultimate Passover lamb, Jesus Christ, shedding his blood to atone for their sins, John 1 verse 29. Therefore, when Jesus gave the disciples the bread and the cup, he let them know the true meaning of the Passover feast that Israel had been celebrating since Exodus by saying that the bread and the cup are his body and blood given for their sins. In the dispensation of grace, we are told, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, Colossians 2 verses 16 to 17. In other words, we should not observe the Passover, because, for us, this shadow is replaced by the real Passover found in Christ. However, Paul says, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23, and then he proceeds to explain that we should have the Lord's Supper in the dispensation of grace, because, as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death, till he come, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. 
In other words, Jesus gave the disciples the real meaning behind the Passover celebration in Israel's program. Then, he took that feast, called it the Lord's Supper, and continued it today. The Passover was celebrated only once per year, but the Lord's Supper is celebrated as often as you want. Also, note that the Lord's Supper is a full meal. Paul says, For in eating every one taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 21 Christian churches today eat a bite of a cracker and a sip of grape juice. No one gets full on a bite of a cracker, and no one gets drunk on a sip of wine. Therefore, the Lord's Supper must be a full meal. In other words, you have the Lord's Supper whenever you eat with other believers. The Christian church has made it something that can only be done at their church, using their crackers and grape juice, so that they can control your fellowship with God, so that you have to keep coming back to their church in order to be in fellowship with God. However, to merely state this is to refute it, inasmuch as Christian baptism was not given until just before the Lord's ascension, Acts 11 verse 26 says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Before this time, the word Christian was never used. How, then, could Christian baptism be given before the Lord's ascension? The reason that there were no Christians until the grace dispensation is because the believing remnant of Israel was not trying to be Christ-like in their program. Instead, they were to trust in the Mosaic covenant that God made with Israel in order for God to give them eternal life in God's earthly kingdom. When the mystery was revealed to Paul in Acts 9, the world was told a completely different message, which is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins. Then, you are given the Holy Spirit and the mind of Christ, and you can live Christ-like or as a Christian. That is a life that was still future in Israel's program, which means that it took the dispensation of grace to generate Christians. The instruction regarding water baptism under this new program is that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, which means that water baptism is not a part of today's dispensation. Christian baptism, as previously discussed, is the dry baptism by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, into the death of Christ, Romans 6 verses 3 to 4, so that we may be raised to new life in his resurrection. This was not given until given to the Apostle Paul in Acts 9. With regard to water baptism in Israel's program, it started with the priests in Exodus 29. God said that the priests are to be washed with water, Exodus 29 verse 4, because Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 verse 6, and the kingdom was at hand when John the Baptist came, Matthew 3 verse 2, all believers in Israel began to be water baptized at that time in order to identify themselves as being separate from apostate Israel and to separate them as being part of the kingdom. Of priests that would go to the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom in the millennial reign. Therefore, Ironside is incorrect. Also, since Ironside says that Christian baptism was given just before the Lord's ascension, he must be saying that the commission to baptize in Matthew 28 verse 19 was different from John's and Jesus' baptisms in John 3 verses 22 to 23. This is significant to note because most Christians reference John's water baptism of Jesus to substantiate water baptisms today, when, according to Ironside, Jesus did not receive a Christian baptism. So, why would you want to be baptized like Christ was, when he received a Jewish baptism, rather than a Christian one, and the Lord's Supper was given from heaven to the Apostle Paul by special revelation, long after Christ's ascension, 1 Cor. 11, 23, 24. Yes, that is true. To read into such a passage as Hebrews 6 verses 1 and 2 any reference to Christian baptism, is ignorance so colossal that it does not even deserve an answer. The Apostle there is definitely referring to Judaism in contrast with Christianity. Paul is the Apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. Hebrews is written to the Hebrews, and it was written when the kingdom of heaven was at hand, Hebrews 3 verse 13. Therefore, it was written before Acts 7, which is before Paul was saved, and is part of Israel's program. As such, there is no contrast between Judaism and Christianity in Hebrews 6 verses 1 to 2, because there was no such thing as Christianity yet. 
Rather than making a contrast between Judaism and Christianity, Hebrews 6 verses 1 to 2 shows that the author wishes to build upon the foundational doctrine that is mentioned in those verses to go on unto perfection. In other words, the author wants the Hebrews to learn more advanced doctrine. He is not getting rid of water baptism. Rather, he is building upon the foundation of salvation in Israel's program, which includes water baptism. There is no contrast given in these verses, as Ironside claims. Also, given Ironside's beliefs, how can he even say that there is a contrast between Judaism and Christianity in these verses? The reason I ask this question is that Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, Therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Ironside teaches that we should follow the Sermon on the Mount and the rest of Christ's teachings found in Matthew, John. Now, he is saying that these principles of the doctrine of Christ really belong to Judaism and not to Christianity. Therefore, he has contradicted himself. The doctrine of baptisms is the teaching of washings under law. Yes, that is exactly what water baptism is. Ironside understands that the Lord's Supper was given to Paul by special revelation, and it is not the Passover celebration that Jesus had his disciples partake in. Why, then, does he not understand that water baptism is a washing under the Mosaic law that was not carried forward to the dispensation of grace, especially when he understands that the doctrine of baptisms does refer to washings under the law? If he recognizes that Paul was given a special revelation from Christ regarding the Lord's Supper, why does he not recognize that Paul was also given a special revelation from Christ regarding water baptism that Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel? 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17, especially when we note that the gospel was given to Paul by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12, since the gospel of the kingdom includes water baptism, Mark 16 verse 16, Acts 2 verse 38, and Christ gave Paul the gospel of grace that does not include water baptism, it should be even clearer to Ironside that water baptism is not part of the dispensation of grace than it is clear that the Lord's Supper was given by special revelation to Paul to be included in the dispensation of grace. To the lover of the Lord Jesus Christ, there can be nothing legal about baptism. The law says, And this is the thing that thou shalt do unto them, to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office, thou shalt wash them with water. Exodus 29 verses 1 and 4. Therefore, water baptism is a thou shalt of the law. This makes water baptism a legal requirement of the law. To say anything different is to deny the truth of God's word. It is simply the glad expression of a grateful heart recognizing its identity with Christ in death, burial, and resurrection. Ironside just said that a saved person is identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Baptism is being identified with something. Therefore, unknowingly, Ironside just admitted that the one baptism of Ephesians 4 verse 5 is a dry baptism of the Spirit into Christ's death. How, then, is water baptism a recognition of this? If you want to go through a ceremony to symbolize the dry baptism of the Spirit into Christ's death, instead of having the preacher dunk you in water, lie down and have him shovel some dirt on you. Then, once you are completely covered, you can get up and thank God that you are identified with Christ's death so that you are also risen to new life in his resurrection. If you still want water, we can hose you off afterward. This may seem silly, but it makes a lot more sense than dunking someone in water. Many of us look back to the moment when we were thus baptized as one of the most precious experiences we have ever known. That's because water baptism is the beginning of people's enslavement in the Christian religion. When someone is baptized in water, instead of saying, buried with Christ and raised to new life with him, the pastor should say, buried into the Baptist denomination and raised to enslavement to our religion. Once you have spent your entire life in that enslavement, you actually think the event that started it all, i.e., water baptism, was a free experience and are thankful for it. Every cult is like that where its members look at their initiation as one of the most precious experiences they have ever known. I assure the pilots who hijacked planes and drove them into the Twin Towers in New York on September 11th, oh one were excited about what they were doing as well, but it does not mean they were doing the right thing. All ultra-dispensationalists do not reject the Lord's Supper, but those who are rigidly tied up to the prison epistles and have practically no other Bible, 
set this blessed ordinance aside in the same curt way that they dismiss water baptism. God says to stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage, Galatians 5 verse 1. In light of our freedom in Christ, why would we want to sit in church, eat a bite of a cracker, take a sip of grape juice, and feel guilty about how our sins nailed Jesus to the cross and call all of this a blessed ordinance? Even in Israel's program, they are told that the blood of Christ purges their conscience from dead works to serve the living God, Hebrews 9 verse 14, and these are people still under the law. How much more, then, should we, being not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14, live in the resurrection life of Christ instead of following a ritual that would bring us back into bondage under the law? We are told that in a spiritual dispensation, there is no place for outward observances. There are things under the law which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, Colossians 2 verse 17. Once the body has come, the shadow should be neglected for the body. That does not mean that there are no outward observances. The Lord's Supper is a great example of the body, because the fellowship that we have with each other being in Christ should show how Christ's body works together for God's glory. But, the true Lord's Supper is fellowshipping over a meal, recognizing such fellowship is made possible by being part of the body of Christ. What churches do, with their cracker, grape juice, and guilt trip by the pastor, enslaves people to be subject to their consciences. It does not set them free. And yet, singularly enough, these brethren meet together for worship and prayer, and that very frequently upon the first day of the week, though they are almost a unit in denying that this is the Lord's day. The day of the week that a group of believers meets is not important. The reason most right dividing churches meet on Sundays is because it is the day when most people are able to meet. As the world becomes more and more secular, more churches will change to a different meeting time. The reason we deny the Lord's day is because every day is the Lord's day. We should not put God in a box by being religious and spiritual on Sundays while neglecting the rest of the week. We have the Holy Spirit all the time. We have the mind of Christ all the time. Paul says, I die daily, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 31, not I die on Sundays. Paul recognizes that he can make the choice every single day to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5 verse 16. Christ liveth in me, Galatians 2 verse 20, every single day, not just on Sundays. Therefore, for a believer, there is no such thing as the Lord's day anymore. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ, Colossians 2 verses 16 to 17. They insist, though the Holy Ghost has himself changed the term, that the Lord's day is identical with the day of the Lord, if Ironside would put off his religious glasses and put on his English grammar glasses, he would note that the Lord's day is the same as the day of the Lord. For example, God's. Love is the same as the love of God, and God's law is the same as the law of God. There is no difference between the two terms, and so the observance of the first day of the week is with them simply gross legality. Think of parting with all the holy privileges of the Lord's day on the plea that it is a mark of higher spirituality to make this a common day like any other. Sunday is no more holy than any other day of the week. If it were, then you would not gain as much by doing a midweek Bible study, as opposed to studying on Sunday. Not once have I ever heard someone say, this is a hard, biblical passage to understand. Let's wait until Sunday to study it so we can learn what it says, because I just can't understand it on Wednesday night. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days, and months, and times, and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor, in vain, Galatians 4 verses 9 to 11. Therefore, observing Sunday as the Lord's Day is a weak and beggarly element of the law that puts Christians in bondage. I know that some quote as authority for this, Paul's words in Romans 14 verse 5, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. 
but an examination of the entire passage in which this verse is found, will make it clear that the Apostle is here referring to Jewish distinctions between clean and unclean meats, and holy and common days, and he would have Gentile believers respect even the legal feeling of their Jewish brethren in these matters. Yes, this is the very reason why Paul had the Corinthian believers baptized. It is important to receive those who are weak in the faith, Romans 14 verse 1, so that they will remain in your church and become strong in the faith through the sound doctrine that is taught. The enlightened Christian of course in a very real sense esteems every day alike, that is, every day is devoted to the glory of God, but this does not mean that he fails to differentiate between days on which he participates in the ordinary activities of the world, and the first day of the week, which is largely set aside for spiritual exercises. We have known men to glory in their liberty, as they called it, who could take part in Christian service on Lord's Day morning and spend the afternoon golfing, or in some other more worldly way, and this on pretense of a higher spirituality than that of those who are supposed to be legal, because they use the hours of the entire day either for their own spiritual upbuilding or for the blessing of others. By saying that Sundays should be reserved only for spiritual activities, they are saying that they will be more godly on Sundays, which gives them license to do whatever they want for the rest of the week. In other words, I have to be holy on Sunday means I can be unholy Monday through Saturday. However, if any day of the week is holier than the other days, it would be Saturdays. One of the Ten Commandments is, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy, Exodus 20 verse 8, which is the seventh day of the week or Saturday. God set aside the seventh day as a day of rest when he created the world. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day, and sanctified it, because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made, Genesis 2 verses 2 to 3. Since one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, 2 Peter 3 verse 8, it has been said that God's reconciliation plan for heaven and earth lasts 6,000 years, and then he rests for 1,000 years, which is the millennial reign. Of course, as time goes on, that theory becomes less likely to be true. However, the point still remains that the seventh day is the day of rest that God established from the creation of the world. Why, then, would people rest on the first day of the week? I understand that the argument is made that believers started meeting on the first day of the week to celebrate Jesus' resurrection, but that is something man did. God is the one who established the seventh day as a day of rest, even though he knew that Jesus would rise from the dead on the first day of the week. It is interesting that, in the dispensation of grace, Paul quotes all of the Ten Commandments except for the one about the Sabbath. The reason is because Israel rested on the Sabbath day because they were under the law. The law is served in the energies of the flesh. God set aside one day per week for Israel to be involved with the things of God. Today, we are not under the law but under grace. We have the Holy Spirit and can walk in the Spirit every single day. Therefore, there is no need for a day of rest each week, because we can rest in Christ every day. That does not mean that we go to church every day. It means that Christ can work through us every day in our normal activities. Therefore, there are no activities that are godly in. themselves, and there is no need to set aside a special day each week for God. Every activity and every day is for God. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Romans 14 verses 6 to 7. This is true because ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Colossians 3 verse 3. Christ liveth in me. Galatians 2 verse 20. Therefore, when a member of the body of Christ participates in the ordinary activities of the world, it is Christ living through him, which makes everything a spiritual activity, even golfing on a Sunday afternoon. It is strange that many, who insist that there are no ordinances or commandments connected with the dispensation of pure grace, should take up collections in their services and urge people to give as unto the Lord to support their ministry. What is strange about this? 
1 Corinthians 9 verse 11 says, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7 says, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. The position that Ironside is taking is that, because we say we are not under the law, all of the things under the law do not apply today, and that is not true. Galatians 3 verses 24 to 25 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Galatians 4 verse 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. When you are a child, you are under your parents' rules. When you become an adult and move out, you are no longer under those rules. However, a lot of those rules that your parents established were good rules, and you may still follow them as an adult. Just because you are no longer under the rules does not mean that you do not follow some of the rules, but you are mature enough to determine how to live your life. Similarly, before. We were saved, we were under the law of our conscience, written in our hearts, Romans 2 verses 14 to 15. Once we are saved, that flesh is wrecked by God to be dead, Romans 6 verse 11. The blood of Christ has purged our conscience from dead works to serve the living God, Hebrews 9 verse 14. We are no longer under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. We now have liberty in Christ, Galatians 5 verse 1, to make wise, spiritual decisions, using the mind of Christ, which we now have, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16. For Israel under the law, they were robbing God if they did not pay their tithes, resulting in them being placed under the curse of the law, Malachi 3 verses 8 to 9. Today, under grace, we are not required to give anything. We just give what we purpose in our hearts. Regardless of what we give, we are blessed, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, Ephesians 1 verse 3. The mature member of the body of Christ will recognize the importance of giving to keep the ministry alive, while the immature believer will say, I don't have to give anything, so, I won't give anything. The difference between law and grace is the difference between being a child and being an adult. It does not mean that we do not do things that God prescribed for Israel to do under the Mosaic law. Maybe we will, maybe we will not. It is our decision in grace. If Ironside finds it strange that people would give to the ministry when they do not have to, it shows that the love of Christ has not constrained him, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14, to serve the Lord through walking in the Spirit, rather than in the energies of the flesh, Galatians 5 verse 16. He must treat his entire congregation as children, which makes me wonder if he has ever shared the gospel of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, dot. Logically, they should tell people that giving is legal and belongs to the old dispensation, but has no place in the present age, when we simply receive but give nothing in return. Giving does not go away under grace. Rather, the motivation to give is different. We do not give to gain favor with God. We give because we have already received favor from God. A good illustration of this is found by comparing forgiving others under the two dispensations. Under the law, Jesus said, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew 6 verses 14 to 15. In other words, they had to forgive in order to be forgiven by God. However, under grace, we are told, be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Ephesians 4 verse 32. In other words, we forgive because we have already been forgiven by God. Under the law, Israel gave in order to be blessed by God. Under grace, we give in response to the blessings that God has already given us in Christ. The passage already referred to in 1 Corinthians 11 makes it clear that though the Apostle Paul did not receive his instruction concerning the observance of the Lord's Supper from the Twelve, it was given to him by special revelation from heaven, thus indicating what an important place it has in this age. Let me get this straight. Ironside says that the Lord's Supper has an important place today because it was given to Paul by special revelation from heaven. 
He gets this from Paul's statement that I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23. Regarding the gospel Paul preached, Paul calls it my gospel, Romans 2 verse 16, Romans 16 verse 25, and 2 Timothy 2 verse 8, and he states, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. Thus, Paul uses stronger language, to indicate that he received a special gospel that no one before him had received, the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, Ephesians 3 verses 2 and 5, and that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Then the language he uses about the instructions for the Lord's Supper. Furthermore, in introducing the gospel, he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. This is very similar language to what he used four chapters earlier in introducing the Lord's Supper. Yet, Ironside completely ignores the gospel of the grace of God given to Paul first, stating that Paul gave the same gospel that Peter gave, but Ironside embraces the special revelation of the Lord's Supper given to Paul, not saying that it was an extension of what the Lord did before he was crucified. The reason Ironside does this is lest he should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, Galatians 6 verse 12, for the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 verse 16. Ironside denies the mystery gospel because the power behind it attacks the flesh, leading to persecution. Ironside embraces the Lord's Supper for the mystery dispensation because the power of salvation is not in it. Surely one is guilty of gross perversion of scripture who dares to teach that since Paul's imprisonment, the Lord's Supper should no longer be observed, when the Holy Ghost has said, As often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Paul says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, Colossians 2 verse 16. Therefore, even though the Acts 28 heirs do not observe the Lord's Supper, they have not sinned in not observing it. The gross perversion of scripture, then, is committed by Ironside when he fails to recognize that a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, because, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed, Galatians 1 verse 9. In other words, if Ironside does not believe Paul's gospel, he will burn in the lake of fire forever, while there will be no such punishment for believers who do not take a sip of grape juice and eat a bite of a cracker every three months. The most sacred hours that many of us have ever known have been those spent with fellow believers seated at the table of the Lord, recognizing in the broken bread and poured out wine the memorials of our Savior's death, and thus in a new way entering into and appropriating the reality of which the symbols speak. Hebrews 9 verse 14 says that the blood of Christ purges your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Galatians 2 verse 19 says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Therefore, Jesus died on the cross to give you life in him. He did not want you sitting around feeling sorry for your sins. That is the sorrow of the world, which worketh death, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, which beguiles you of your reward in a voluntary humility, Colossians 2 verse 18. Instead of dwelling on death, it would be much more blessed to dwell on the resurrection life that we have in Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ. Liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me, and gave himself for me, Galatians 2 verse 20. Note how that verse mentions death once, but life five times. Jesus Christ stayed in the grave only as long as he had to. Life is the focus of God, while death is the focus of man. That is why Catholics still have Jesus on the cross, and why Protestants sit around feeling sorry for sending Jesus to the cross. The victory over death has already been won. Instead of contemplating the sip of grape juice and the bite of cracker with tears rolling down your face over how sorry you are that Christ had to die for you, say with Paul, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
1 Corinthians 15 verse 57. Therefore, we will yield ourselves unto God, as those that are alive from the dead, Romans 6 verse 13. Get your thoughts out of the grave, and live in Christ's resurrection life. We may be thought legal, because we refuse to surrender such precious privileges at the behest of some of our self-styled, not self-styled, but Christ-styled. Christ is no longer in the grave, and neither should we be there. God has already reckoned us to be dead to sin, and God tells us to likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6 verse 11. So, stop expressing worldly sorrow and start living in the resurrection life of Jesus Christ our Lord, expositors of pure grace. But we remember that the grace of God's salvation bringing for all men, hath appeared, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, in entering into and appropriating the reality of Jesus' death, Ironside is living in the flesh, rather than living in the salvation from the flesh that the resurrection life of Jesus Christ gives us. There is no joy in reliving death, but you can rejoice evermore, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 16, in being quickened and raised together with Christ to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 verses 5 to 6. Ironside's shoe of wisdom in will worship and humility results in the satisfying of the flesh, Colossians 2 verse 23, but living in Christ's resurrection satisfies the spirit and brings glory to God. That is how you live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Titus 2 verse 12. And until he come, by his grace, to remember him in the way of his own. Appointment. Eating the bread and drinking the cup, spiritually speaking, are done by the sober, righteous, godly living that comes as a result of attaining unto the resurrection of the dead, Philippians 3 verse 11, by walking in the spirit, Romans 8 verse 4. That is how ye do shew the Lord's death, till he come, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 26. If all you do is take a sip of grape juice and a bite of a cracker in the confines of a church while living just like the world outside of the church, not only do you not show the Lord's death, but you blaspheme God's name. In other words, you are saying, the Lord's death didn't do squat for me, because I lived just as carnally as I ever did. If you want to be a self-righteous hypocrite, then come to my church. Concluding Remarks In closing this review of the system of teaching which we have had before us, I do not think it necessary to go into the questions at any length of soul sleeping and annihilation, conditional immortality, or the opposite view of the final restoration of universalism. Rightly dividing the word of truth does not support soul sleep, annihilation, or universalism as sound doctrine. People came up with those doctrines by following theology, not by following God's word rightly divided. As already mentioned, the followers of the late drive E. W. Bullinger have largely taken up with the first type of teaching in Great Britain, whereas in America many of them have supported universalist views. But these heretical teachings have been so ably answered on many different occasions by other writers, that it would seem like a work of supererogation to go into them now. I only mention them, in fact, as a warning to those who are dabbling with this system, for that which looks so innocent in the beginning often ends up in complete departure from the faith once delivered to the saints. This is the danger of religious systems. People base their doctrines upon what a church teaches, not upon what the Bible teaches. If the Bible is your final authority, you will compare all doctrine with what the Bible teaches rightly divided, and your beliefs will be entirely based upon scripture. However, if you go running to your pastor, Sunday school teacher, or some other expert for answers, that person may lead you astray. The Bereans received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things, which Paul taught, were so. Therefore many of them believed, Acts 17 verses 11 to 12. That is what we should do. We should never follow a religious system, even if that system is an Acts 9 dispensationalist one, because, if false doctrine is introduced into that system, you will be led astray. Instead, ask the question, what saith the scripture? Romans 4 verse 3, and believe the scripture. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. If all I am hearing is theology and religion, then I do not have faith in God's word. 
One who was a leading advocate of bullyingerism on the West Coast for many years, has put out literature recently which denies the eternal sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ, the true personality of the Holy Spirit, and many other important truths. As I just mentioned, no one should ever follow a religious system. On the flip side, no one should ever reject doctrine just because a particular religious system espouses it. Bollinger helped greatly in the recovery of truth, and his writings are a great tool to use in learning sound doctrine. The great thing about making the Bible your final authority is that the Holy Spirit will use scripture to teach you the things of God, because they are spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. Therefore, you can compare any teacher's doctrine to scripture rightly divided and learn the sound doctrine while rejecting the false doctrine. Without the Holy Spirit, you will believe all doctrine that one religious system espouses, which almost always includes false doctrine. In order to support his restoration system, he has put out a private translation of the New Testament which, by his disciples, is generally accepted as absolute authority. That is exactly what modern Bible translations do. They all use a corrupt Greek New Testament in order to change the truth of God into a lie, Romans 1 verse 25, that will fit their religious system. That is what the New King James, New International, New Living, and all other modern translations do. They are all part of the slight of men and cunning craftiness to deceive you into being carried about with every wind of doctrine, Ephesians 4 verse 14. Making no pretense to scholarship myself, since God promised to preserve his word forever without error, Psalm 12 verses 6 to 7, Matthew 24 verse 35, there is no need to get involved with scholarship. Just read and believe your King James Bible, but simply seeking to be a reverent student of the English Bible with whatever help I have been enabled to glean throughout more than 40 years of studying the Word, your help is the Holy Spirit teaching you the things of God, and not anything else. I hesitated to pronounce upon many of the peculiar translations in this new New Testament, but several years ago it was my privilege to spend some time in company with the late Dr. A. T. Robertson, undoubtedly the foremost Greek scholar in America, and possibly without a peer elsewhere. I asked him if he had ever examined the version in question. If Ironside has believed in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for his sins, he has the Holy Spirit to teach him the things of God. Therefore, he does not need to rely upon a man's opinion about a version. Rather, he could just read it himself and allow the Holy Spirit to show him that it is a corrupted version. Surely, someone, who has studied the Word for over 40 years, as Ironside has, would have such spiritual discernment if he is saved. With a look of disgust, he said, I certainly did. The editor had the impertinence to send me a copy, and asked me to commend his ignorance to others. I said, Doctor, would you give me in a few words your real estimate of this work? and give me the privilege of quoting you as occasion may arise? The doctors of the law, in Jesus' day, Luke 5 verse 17, did not even believe the law, John 5 verses 46 to 47. Why, then, would Ironside care about what some Greek doctor thinks? He replied, I can give it to you in two words, piffle and puffle, and you may tell anyone that that is my estimate of this vaunted translation. In giving publicity to this conversation, my desire is to warn those who are carried away by great pretense to learning, who may not themselves be familiar with the original languages in which the Bible was written, and are therefore easily impressed by a parade of assumed scholarship. Being familiar or not with the original languages has nothing to do with being easily impressed by a parade of assumed scholarship. Jesus said, Thy word is truth, John 17 verse 17. If you believe that, the only thing you will be impressed by is God's holy word, and you will. Quickly discard a corrupt Bible translation, regardless of how many Greek scholars say it should be followed. Similarly, you will still believe the King James Version is God's holy word today in English, even though most scholars criticize it. The reason they criticize the KJV is because they did not write it. Therefore, they do not get royalties from KJV Bible sales, like they do for their corrupted Bible versions. The Word of God is not bound. 2 Timothy 2 verse 9 Generally speaking, I have sought to avoid personalities in this discussion. Many otherwise excellent men have taken up these new views. I have no quarrel with men. I do not desire to reflect upon or belittle any of them. 
It is the truth of God that is in question, and my appeal is therefore to the word itself. Really? What about the terms, satanic perversions of the truth, damnable heresies, and childish diatribes that Ironside used against those with opposing views to himself? There is no need for name-calling when you stand on the truth of God's word as your argument against false doctrine. We can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 8. It should be very telling that I have used many more scripture references than Ironside has. That is not to say that the one with the most scripture references wins, but it shows that my beliefs are based on the truth of God's word. By contrast, Ironside's beliefs in this paper are largely the opinions of man that are supported by limited scripture, and that taken out of context. Singularly enough, since these papers began running serially, I have received abusive letters from a number of different teachers accusing me of attacking them. Well, what do you expect when you use such strong language against your opponents? People tend to fight fire with fire, especially when their livelihoods are attacked by a prominent person in their field. If Coke attacked Pepsi, Pepsi would attack Coke. Similarly, when Ironside, who made considerable money from the Christian religion, attacks others who do the same, they will fight back too. Maintain their empire. One such writes that he is neither a Bullingerite nor an ultra-dispensationalist and resents being so designated. Each one must draw his own conclusions as to whether he holds the views I have endeavored to refute. I speak as unto wise men. Judge ye what I say. This is a quote of 1 Corinthians 10 verse 15, which is interesting because the previous verse says, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. If you want to flee from the idolatry of the Christian religion, you will compare what Ironside has said with the scripture and judge that he is in error. In bringing these papers to a close, I would urge interested readers to remember the exhortation of the Apostle, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Yes, and the way you prove all things is to compare them with scripture, not with what Christianity says.